uh, teaching elder Stephen Warhurst from Westminster Presbytery. I must be really unpopular. What time is it? It's 11.30. I go to bed at 10 usually. But I want to present this to you because I think it's a, an excellent overture from Westminster Presbytery. We formed a study committee to look into Revoice, did an investigation, found several errors, and wanted to uh, correct those errors. So, but this overture rose out of that study, and it's meant to help pastors, teachers, and parents by providing a biblical means of dealing with those whom they love and want to help who struggle with homosexuality. But we wanted to provide biblical clarity on this topic that enabled those who love people who struggle with this sin in two ways. First, we wanted to protect them from falling into the lies and deceptions of the homosexual propaganda that inundates us every day. They love these people, they want to help them, but we don't want them to fall into the lies that inundate our culture. And secondly, we want to give them biblical guidance on how to show true love for homosexuals instead of the pseudo love that the world wants us to show them, which is really just to affirm them in their sin, which is not true love at all. And I just want to highlight a few instances where this overture seeks to do that. At the Revoice Conference, there was an attempt to separate attraction, homosexual attraction and orientation from the actual homosexual act. And some seem to imply, and maybe spoke outrightly, that, that you could actually have the attractions and be oriented in this way. And that's not sinful. That's OK. It's the acts that are bad. And we're glad that they condemned the act of sodomy. But we were disturbed that they gave a buy or treated as neutral these attractions when Romans 1, and 27 says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And the first example of a vile passion here in this passage is even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful. The apostle. Point of order. Microphone number three, point of order. Uh, Mr. Moderator, David Richter, Southern New England Presbytery. Um, Others, brothers, I know the Revoice um, uh, issue has been one of great debate and disagreement among us, uh, but they are not uh, a PCA organization. And I'm not sure why we have an overture at this point or a minority of point, uh, report at this point directly related to answering issues that they brought up. Now, I know that's a larger conversation. Can you, can I don't you be more, is, more specific? On I don't the... believe this is appropriate, Mr. Moderator. Okay. It's not Jermaine. Uh, I think I have 15 minutes, right, to present the minority report. Uh, you may continue, but I'll stay at the mic. I won't go back to my chair. I'll rule that it is uh, that line of argumentation is not germane to Overture 28. What was the what was the ruling? That the line of argumentation is not germane to Overture 28. I'm trying to commend the Overture. The chair has been challenged. Those gentlemen. Point of order. Microphone number three. Ewan Kennedy, Metro Atlanta Presbytery. If we look at lines through 12 through 14, this overture is specifically addressing revoice. So it's not just the argument of the speaker that uh, Pastor Richter was uh, arguing against was out of order. Uh, it's the, the whole focus of uh, this minority report is answering revoice. Uh, and I don't think that's germane to the work of the assembly. Uh, especially when the Missouri Presbytery has already investigated a revoice at Greg Johnson's uh, own request. And so we've had some situations before where we've said the wording in an overture can rule it out of order. Mr. Warhurst, you may continue. I believe we'll get to a vote on this very quickly, but please continue spe specifically on uh, the, why you're substituting for the uh, majority. Thank you, sir. 
this again, I think, is an attempt to try to help people pastorally care for those whom they love who struggle with this sin. It's not just an answer to revoice, but it does deal with the errors of revoice and seeks to protect people who are trying to help the people they love from the, the errant teachings there. But the attraction to the opposite sex is apart from God's order. It's not how God ordered the world at the beginning. He gave us male and female, and uh, we were to be fruitful and multiply together. And I want to go back to the attraction where I was interrupted. The, uh, the Bible says that these are vile passions. They're against nature. And so the attraction itself is sin. And this overture points that out so that people aren't deceived into thinking we can separate the attraction and the orientation from the act. They're all sin. And that's where Article 2 bears down on this, we believe is a, a serious error. We affirm that homosexual attraction is a vile, degrading, and dishonorable passion, and those who condone homosexuality invite the further judgment of God. Those seem like harsh words, but if you look at the translations, if you're on page 226, those are just the translations from our three major translations of the word pathe atomias vile passions, degrading passions, dishonorable passions. These are three different ways of elaborating the meaning of that word. And if these things are vile, then we should not say that they're neutral or somehow not sinful. The American Psychological Association defines sexual orientation, and this is a big part of this debate, and we don't want people to be deceived as they help those they love and thinking sexual orientation is okay. Sexual orientation refers to an enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, and or sexual attractions to men, women, or both sexes. In this case, it would be an emotional, romantic, sexual attraction to someone of the same sex. That's how the American Psychological Association defines it. Well, if, a, if sexual orientation is an enduring pattern of a vile passion or a vile attraction or a sinful attraction, then both the attraction and the orientation are sinful, both. And so if homosexual attraction is sinful, then homosexuality, homosexual orientation, which is an enduring pattern of that attraction, is also sinful. And we don't want people helping others to be deceived into separating them. And then there's, I'll just go through a few, a few others that I think are helpful. I want you to see the helpfulness of this document and how it would help people if you gave it to someone. If a parent comes, you say, my son just said this. You can give them this document. It has affirmations and denials that make things clear for them, and it has biblical texts, which was one of the complaints about um, the Nashville Statement. This has biblical texts that they can look and look at most of the texts that deal with this issue in the Scriptures. Article 3, we affirm Jesus condemned both sinful sexual attractions and sinful actions. Again, nailing down on this issue that people are much deceived about. Jesus says, Matthew 5, 27 and 28, if you have heard, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone that looks at a woman with lust for her has committed, already committed adultery with her in his heart. If Jesus condemned the natural desire for a woman other than your wife, it's a sin, it's adultery, how much more would he condemn the unnatural desire for a person of the same sex? So sexual sin is not limited to particular actions but it begins in the attractions of the heart. At the conference and in many places, LGBT people are spoken of as sexual minorities. And this is, I believe, an attempt to deceive us about this issue. Article four, we affirm that those with homosexual attractions, incestuous attractions, and bestial attractions are sexual minorities in the church. And by that we mean they are a minority in number. But look at the denial after that. We deny that there is any virtue in being identified as a sexual minority because all these dispositions are sinful. So also, the, I think mixed up in this sexual minority is an attempt to identify the LGBT plus with racial minorities or ethnic minorities. Uh, but there are very important differences and distinctions we need to make here. Race is immutable has nothing to do with unlawful attractions or desires. LGBT plus identities are immutable and they center around unlawful attractions and desires. Race is benign. Unlawful sexual attraction is sin. These are hard words, but these are words that people need to know if they're going to help others and not be sucked into the propaganda of the homosexual 
movement as they love those who struggle with this sin. Article 5 starts to deal with the attitude we should have towards those we're trying to help. We affirm that God, by His grace, can change unnatural sexual orientations. It was mentioned that this is rare in the experience of many. But we believe that Apostle Paul knew some of these people. Verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 6, Such were some of you, that you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. Now, to move on in the overture, just to point out a few more uh, things that I think would be helpful to those who are helping others with this, is to alert them to the fact that many people who do not, who have this attraction, don't want it. They don't want this attraction at all. And they're struggling against it. And there's much shame and trouble with it that comes with it. And what we're encouraged to do is to become comfortable with that sin, and I, I don't think we should do that. Article 7 says, we, uh, we affirm that Christians ought to abhor homosexual sin. Abhorrence of all sins should be cultivated. Fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's what the Bible teaches. And this sin is an abomination according to Leviticus 18.22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. And if God abhors something, we should abhor it too. Those who love God should hate evil. And Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Part of the homosexual propaganda is to desensitize us to what God calls an abomination, to make us think it's okay. And this is a warning to those who help them not to fall into that. It's not a bad thing to be repulsed by sin. If God gives you a repulsion to sin, praise him for it. If he gives you, you're repulsed by your sin, that's a blessing. If you're ashamed of your sin, that's grace. It's that repulsion and that shame that should drive you to Christ, the Savior of sinners. And if we try to take away that shame and the repulsion of it, we don't do a service to people, we hurt them. If you have a person who has cancer and they're dying of cancer and you have the cure and you say you're really okay, peace, peace, you're not helping them, you're not loving them, you're hating them. These people are struggling with a sin that is killing them. Shame, all the struggles that they have with it. And we want to go to them and say, come to Christ. He'll save you from your sins. And shame seems to be a big part of this, and we shouldn't try to diminish it. We should say, yes, let that shame drive you to Christ, the only one who can take away the shame of sin. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 6, 14 and 15, Speaking of these false prophets, they have also healed the hurt of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall. We do not want our homosexual friends to fall under the judgment of God. So we have to not say peace, peace to them, but say the shame is right. The disgrace is right. Forsake it. Turn to Christ. He's the one who delivers from shame. And Jesus did meet with sinners. He ate with sinners, tax collectors. And he said that he did not call the healthy, but he came to call the sick to repentance, sinners to repentance. So we don't affirm the sin. We call them to repentance. Well, it's like, and I hope that you see some of the... Um, virtues of this and if we pass this this would be something we can give to people who love people with homosexual sin and take it as that it's not an attempt to hurt them it's an attempt to help them and it's chock full of biblical proofs as to how we can best do that thank you for your patience